Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at the uh, cluster package in R. Right, the cluster package in R has a lot of features for doing unsupervised learning. Uh, specifically, it's got some uh, hierarchical uh, methods that we haven't looked at yet, and it also has some partitioning methods that we haven't looked at yet. All right, so let's go ahead and get started and start digging in. All right, so first part of this code is just loading the data we want to use. Once again, we're using the decathlon uh, data set. And so I'm loading the data from the cluster var package. Uh, now to reduce the printout on the uh, R markdown document, I'm reducing the number of digits to print to just one. And here I'm just reordering my variables. So that I kind of have like more similar items together. I've got the runs and the, uh, you know, the hurdle, just kind of a run and jump. And then I've got the jumps and then I've got the throws. Right. And so remember when I'm talking about clustering, almost always I want, to re, I want to rescale my data so that we've got mean zero and standard deviation of one. Now, this step right here, I'm taking the first principal component and I'm reordering the data along the first principal component. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this just so that I can see, like when, when I look at my clusters, if, they, if the clustering corresponds well to the first principal component, which it probably will most of the time, then I should see that the, the rows will be grouped together. And I can see like all of the first clusters will be like on the earlier rows, all the last clusters will be the later rows if it corresponds well to the first principal component. All right, so now let's take a look at the hierarchical methods. There's three of them in the uh, uh, cluster package. There's Agnes, which is very similar to the hclust function in base R. I haven't really seen how it's very different in performance. Um, I think I'm missing something, but the output looks very similar to me and you can put in the distance and the uh, same methods for hclust. So I think it's probably pretty similar, uh, at least for, our op for us operationally. Uh, Diana, Diana is a, di a divisive algorithm. It starts with everything in one group and then splits them apart by looking at the, uh, the two points that are the farthest apart within a group and then splits and then repeats by finding within a group the two, that are, the two points that are the farthest apart until each point is in its own cluster. Now Mona, Mona is specialized for binary data only. So if you're, you've got something like test scores of correct, incorrect, this would be a good way for to do your clustering. All right, so let's take a look at our uh, first one, our glomative nesting. It's hierarchical clustering. This is Agnes, is how they abbreviate. Now something that's kind of funny in this uh, package is they use a lot of like, like your, your grandmother's and your grandma's sister's you know, names in this. They've got Fanny, they've got Diana, they've got Mona. Uh, so a lot of women's names, but not women's names that you really encounter nowadays. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I'm just running the, the base version of it. I'm set, keeping it at the defaults. And some mosquitoes are flowing around me, so if I start swatting, please forgive me. I'm a bit distracted because I don't wanna get bit. All right, so I can go in, I can set other parameters on uh, this function, but since there's a lot in this package, I don't want to get into the weeds of this so much. I'm just going to go ahead and leave almost everything on default for this video. That way, if you get interested in it, if it piques your interest, please look at the help documentation in R and then, you know, dig in. All right, so here I'm just, you know, running it. I'm dropping my scaled version of the data and then I go ahead and plot. All right, so the first thing we see for our plot is a banner plot. A banner plot tells us like when does an, an individual observation get merged with other observations. Now notice that I've got, the scale goes from zero to 5.5. And on the x-axis, that's height. If I go down here, I look at the dendrogram, it goes from zero, like down here, to 5.5. So if we look, All right, so the least value is something like 1.5, let's say. 
1.5 all the way up to just short of six. So if I look for 1.5, I can see, hey, right about there, that looks like that's merging at about 1.5. And I can see that here, this merging is just short of six. So the banner plot is representing this. So this is, uh, so what this is trying to show us is how much of a difference in the height are the different mergings on our dendrogram. If we have like good solid uh, clustering, we would expect to see bigger gaps in the height. Now, when we go through and use my technique for replacing heights with ranks, like we did for the coefficient calculations, uh, this, uh, this banner plot really is not gonna be meaningful if we run that. And we can convert an Agnes object to an h clust object very easily. And it gives us some information about it. And we can print out an Agnes object. And so here it just like lists out the names, gives us uh, summary statistics of the height and tells us what components are available if I want to start digging in and start looking at the individual aspects. We can convert uh, an Agnes object to a dendrogram, which is a, uh, a similar representation to the tree structure that we see in that plot. Qtree is how we get the actual clusters going. So here, here are the, for each row, this tells us that the first row goes in the first cluster, the, the second row goes in the first cluster, the third row goes in the second cluster, and so on. So now, if I'm looking, if, if I feel like, or sorry, if the clustering corresponds very well to the first principal component because I sorted it, I would see it would go like one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 four, 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 like that. So here I can see how far off it is from the first principal component. Now the next one we've got, out, got here is the Diana algorithm. This is the divisive way of going, puts everything into one group and starts dividing the group into smaller groups and then those in the smaller groups until we have individual observations. Here we uh, select the metric, but we do not select the algorithm for um, defining the clustering. And here's our banner plot. We can see that it's going from about 1.5 all the way up to almost nine. All right, let's see if we can find 1.5. I go here, it looks like about it maybe. It's merging about at 1.5 and we can see that it's merging above eight, just short of nine. So the banner plot corresponds to the mergings. And just like with Agnes, we can convert it to an h clust object. Now here, if I print it, it's gonna tell me where are the mergings actually happening in the plot itself, which I don't think is that, that interesting, but it's information that might be useful down the road. Here is the height of the merges and the objects that we can pull out. We can convert it to a dendrogram just like before and we can go ahead and partition using Qtree just like we did previously. Now on the next one, this one is interesting because it handles uh, binary data exclusively. So if I have a data set that's all zeros and ones or I can convert it to zeros and ones. So let's say I have a bunch of data that has a bunch of yes, no's, male, female. If I can convert everything to zeros and ones, then I want to, like let's say it's categorical data, then this is a good choice to use. So here, this algorithm can only handle binary. So what I'm gonna do, this step here 
is I'm converting to a binary. I'm saying if it's bigger than the median, then I want it to be a one. If it's smaller than the median, I want it to be a zero. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm taking this, the rescaled version of my data and then I'm going along and I'm seeing if it's bigger than the median of that variable, it's bigger than the median of the variable, then this is a logical statement that will tell me true or false. True if it's bigger, false if it's less than or equal to. And then I've got true, this tells me true or false, is it bigger? And then as numeric converts a true to a one and a zero and a false to a zero. And so now I can just run it, run Mona on it. Let's see what we get. All right, so here we go. Order of the objects. See, it's just the people's names. List out the variables. And then we get our banner plot. So, you know, here we've got nine, here we've got a one. All right, so now let's talk about our partitioning methods. All right, so here, these are the tech, these are techniques that are similar to k-means. Previously, those were hierarchical methods. Hierarchical methods, it's gonna go through and it's gonna create that hierarchy. It's gonna create clusters of every single size I could possibly want. And there's gonna be like a hierarchical relationship. If I go from two to three, I know that uh, like two in the three, two of those subsets, two of those clusters are contained in one of the previous two clustering groups. Here, what's going on is I'm saying, I want a particular value. I want there to be two or three or four. And once I have it, if I change my mind on the number of clusters, I have to rerun the whole thing. All right, so first we've got Clara, which is good for big data, but it's sensitive to outliers, just like k-means. Fanny is a method for fuzzy uh, clustering, and it gives you a likelihood that a point belongs in a cluster. This one does not perform very well on this data set, so I, I wouldn't use it, but we'll go ahead and take a look at what's going on. Uh, and then Pam is using, it's similar to using, think of it as the median version of k-means. K-means uses averages, Pam uses medians, so it's very robust. It's a good choice if, let's say for some reason you can't rescale, but you need to rescale. So Clara is good for large data, but it's not robust. You know, it can get thrown off by outliers just like k-means. And remember, I, for these techniques, I have to tell the, it, how many clusters I want. Let's go ahead and plot it. Let's see what we get. All right, so it's gonna plot along the first principal component and the second principal component. And remember in our previous video for this data set, we found that first principal component is like their overall performance because it corresponds well with points. And then here is the contrast between their, the, the track events and the field events. Here we have the silhouette plot. So remember, with, when I look at a silhouette plot, I would want to see that the points are getting bars to the right. The bigger the points, uh, or if, if a point has a bar that's going far to the left, then I question if that point belongs in this cluster. This point, whichever one it corresponds to, it's in cluster one, it might belong to another one. I, I'd have to look. But remember, anytime you're looking at a silhouette plot, almost always you're gonna get a few bars going to the left. Uh, this one, I kind of consider this kind of borderline. I'd want to double check before I would actually launch this at work.
And all right, so with this, remember we get something similar to centers, but it's giving me a medioids. So it's using the median for the centers, similar to k-means, and here's the output. So something about this is you'll notice that this is giving actual observations as being the centers effectively. And so here, something that's nice about this is that if I'm in a situation where I want the center to actually be an observation instead of the average of observations, this does that for me very nicely. And here I've got my clustering vector. So here we can see that we got two and then we got a bunch of twos on the right. And so this is kind of like showing me that there is kind of, a, this is really not picking up the information from the first principal component. This is picking up some other aspect of the data. So this is interesting that if I, if I start analyzing the first principal component, this is gonna give me a different like insight into the data if I start digging in. Now here we've got fuzzy analysis clustering. The, what this does that's nice is that it gives us a likelihood that each point belongs to a particular cluster. Uh, now, when I ran through this, I ran a couple of different iterations, a couple of different tries, and the likelihoods were stupid. They, they, were, they were not meaningful. I'm gonna show you the output uh, just so that you have it for down the road. So when I plot it, once again, we get uh, principal, you know, it's going along the principal components, and we can see that we've got the ellipses overlapping each other. The more the ellipses overlap, the less faith I really have in uh, this clustering, honestly. Uh, now, if I go to maybe first and third principal components or second and third principal components, and I see separation on the ellipsoids, then I'll have confidence in it. But, uh, and this is honestly, this isn't that bad. Uh, you know, you're gonna see them overlap a little bit. Like here, this is what we don't want to see. Like we see, like these guys are all jumbled up. Uh, so I, I would not really trust this output for clustering. I, I would not use this at work. All right, let's see. Here's the silhouette plot. The silhouette plot looks really good. But when I get down here, I start looking at the likelihood for each of these. So here, this is corresponding to point, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So it's saying basically uniform distribution for all these points. So it's not informative, not useful. Uh, I, I would not use this clustering at work because I want to keep my job. If I'm going to lose my job, I want to do it on my terms, not because I've made a bad model. And here we've got our clustering going. And so we notice that it goes first and second, pretty, you know, one, 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 and then two, 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 two. So that's kind of interesting. You know, remember that we did sort along the first principal component, but so there's, you know, definitely a correspondence there. Now the next one is uh, partitioning around medoids. This one is very similar to k-means, but instead of using uh, the mean, the average, I'm using the median. And instead of having a computed average as a center, I'm gonna have individual observations being my center. So let's go ahead and run that, see what happens. All right, so here, I can see a lot of overlap with my ellipses. So I'm like, eh, I'm really not feeling this. I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling a whole lot of love for this plotting either. Here's my silhouette plot, but the silhouette plot looks good. This is a really good one. So something about clustering is a lot of times you'll get contradictory information on is this good, is this bad. You have to you know, basically just start digging in looking at different clusterings and look at how they perform on the problem that you're interested in before before you can really get intuition. Um, I still wouldn't use it, honestly, even though silhouette 
looks really good. So here, let's take a look at the metoids. So remember, we've got four clusters, and this is saying that McMullen's data is the center of the first one. Clay is the like the center of the second and you know third and the fourth center. So with uh, Pam, what it does, it goes through and it uses an actual observation as being the center of the cluster instead of taking an average over that, which is which might be nice. It depends on what's important to you. If you want to minimize the sum of squares, if you want to minimize variance, k-means is a better choice. But if you have issues with robustness, like you know, you've got some outliers or some extreme values, and you can't get rid of them, you can't impute them. Uh, you know, PAM is a good choice. And now here we can see that uh, these clusters are not, you know, it's not going one, two, three, four. So we can tell that whatever this is picking, whatever information this is picking up in the data, it's different than the first principal component. So if I want to start digging in, the, the information I'm gonna get from this is gonna be different than what I'll get from a principal component analysis. All right, now the next thing I want to talk about is a, uh, another way to get a distance matrix. So, the, you know, this is going to be a, a dissimilarity matrix calculation where what's important about this that's in cluster that's not in base R is the Gower metric. The Gower metric is able to take care of categorical data, numerical data, and a mixture of them. All right, so what it does is it goes through and it allows us to have a whole bunch of different data types in there. When we talked about distance matrices previously, all of the data had to be numeric. Now, if I really want to use a particular metric, I would have to somehow convert categorical data to numeric, usually using dummy variables, or I would have to throw out the categorical data. Here, I don't have to make that choice. I can just dump it in. Uh, now, that may be good for your problem. That may not. You have to do the analysis check both ways. And so here, remember that the data set has 41 rows. So the full version, if I was to go with scale M instead of the first five rows, I would have a 41 by 41 matrix. It's kind of big, I don't wanna really look at it. It's clogging things up. So I only took the first five rows. I set this to Gower. Now here, I didn't really need to do Gower because it's all numeric data. I could have just gone with the Euclidean or Manhattan, but I wanted you to see how to execute it if I did have you know, ordinal data in there. And it'll give us the, if I do summary, it'll give us a summary statistics of our distances. Now, this function computes the ellipsoid hole that uh, encompasses an entire data set. Now this is really, so remember, when we're talking about multivariate normal distribution, those correspond to uh, ellipsoids, hyper, higher dimension ellipsoid things. So what this is doing, this is finding one of those ellipsoids that contains the entire data set. All right, so now, now this it really isn't gonna be that useful for us is mainly going to be an under the hood thing that I don't really care about what this does, but we need to know about it because remember when we were looking at all those plots previously, we saw all the ellipses. Those ellipses are being generated by this function or possibly a function in, in the mass package that does a similar job. Now here, this is the covariance matrix. So when I'm talking about uh, multivariate normal distribution, we have our mean and we have our covariance. So here's the estimated covariance matrix of our multivariate normal. If, if this data is actually multivariate normal, uh, you know, we need, for this to be meaningful, we need to have that assumption going. And we can compute the volume of the ellipsoid, which is also given here in the output. And that kind of tells us like how big our data is in higher dimensional space. All right, so this is all I've got for you. I hope you're doing well and staying healthy.